Good afternoon and welcome to this um, event on the initiatives taken in, in the EU to improve the management of climate-related financial risks in the banking and insurance sectors. I'm Almoro Riban Savin. I'm the uh, head of uh, the banking team in uh, BGFISMA, which is the financial services uh, directorate in uh, the European uh, uh, Commission. Mm, and I have a very distinguished panel uh, to talk to you before going to that couple of sort of uh, 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 issues setting the scene. This event is part of a series of events we're organizing, uh, in particular today with a focus on, on, on finance. We had an event this morning on the International uh, Platform for Stable Finance, in particular, notably on in transition uh, work. Um, there's a, was a panel also on ESG disclosure and on sustainability reporting. Um, there's a panel also on challenge and opportunities in implementing taxonomies with a significant international uh, uh, participation. And then there are also other uh, events on uh, sustainable funding, on discussion with banks. And there are also events organized by others, for instance, like by the, our partners in, in the central banks in the networks of the financial system on the importance of data for climate risk management and, and policy making. So this is part of a, a collective effort. And so I think and some of the issues will also uh, come out in our own uh, presentation. So as mentioned, this the event focuses on uh, um, how regulation and supervision can improve management of climate-related financial risks by banks and insurers. Um, together with my distinguished uh, uh, colleagues in the panel, we will be present the current and the forthcoming EU regulatory and supervisory initiatives. But before introducing the, the speakers, a couple of organizational points, um, notably the possibility for participants to put questions using the Slido. Uh, thanks for putting that online. Um, and so after the presentation, uh, there will be a, a, a space for a, a, a discussion and I hope nourished by your own question which would also be uh, hopeful, interesting feedback on our, our own presentation, but also on your own uh, experience. Um, I think I've spoken too much uh, from my side that I would uh, uh, go to straight to the first speaker, where there's a small change in the program. We have, um, instead of Fausto Parente from uh, IOPA, we have uh, Justin Reid, who's the head of policy uh, development in uh, uh, IOPA, Replacing Fausto, who um, no, unfortunately was unable to uh, to come today. Justin, the um, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amoro, and hello to everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to to speak today and to set out um, what EOPA is trying to achieve and um, in sustainable finance and what are our priorities for the um, for the forthcoming period. Just very briefly, EOPA is the European Supervisory Authority for insurance and pensions. So what I will speak about will, will relate to um, sustainable finance and, um, and the insurance and pensions sector. So um, I think we have some slides. Um, and I will maybe while those are, are, are coming up, I will, um, I will say a couple of things. Um, I mean, EOPA has three principal objectives in relation to sustainable finance. Um, one of these, the first of these, reflects um, reflects that insurers are society's risk managers, and I think that in terms of the unique contribution that insurers can make. Um, it is this risk management function which is um, which is the most prominent, and um, it, one of our one of our objectives, therefore, one of the OPA's objectives, is that insurers should manage and mitigate uh, ESG risks appropriately. So, the sort of underwriting activities of insurers um, for the rest of the economy should be should be managed and mitigated um, in the right way. Maybe I should pause. Just check. Should I put the slides up is it uh let me see if i can do that um 
I think they are up, but not on the main page. I don't know if the technical team can put them on the main page for everybody to see them. You, you, you can pin them. Otherwise, I can try and do that. Um, you can, you can pin. Justin, you can go on. Okay, okay. Um, there we go. I think I think I've succeeded in sharing them. So the, I, I was talking about the first objective: the, the insurers um, and their role as uh, society's risk managers. The second objective relates to um, consumers, so insurance policyholders, pension scheme members. And that insurers and pension funds should reflect the preferences of their policyholders or members for sustainable investments. Um, and this is this is a, an interesting question, and I think to some extent it's an intergenerational question. That for uh, for younger people, it's more or less taken as given that uh, in the investments of the insurers and pension funds to which they belong should be sustainable. We've had some other surveys, say of pensioners, where it's more, well, give us the money. Um, so you, know, you get you get different attitudes, but what is what is in this objective is that um, insurers and pension funds should be responsive to those whose money is in these is in these funds. And the final uh, objective is in relation to investors. I mean, both insurers and pension funds are substantial investors, both in the European economy and more widely, and that they should adopt a sustainable approach in their investments um, based on principles of stewardship. And I think that this is a this highlights a particularly important aspect. Of what is what is called double materiality. So, when making investments, insurers and pension funds have clearly to take into account climate risks, say physical risk, transition risk. Um, uh, the impact of those risks on their balance sheets, but they should also think about the impact of the investments they make on sort of wider society. And this kind of principle known as double materiality is now being kind of captured in European legislation. And you know, very broadly, you can say that it is kind of consistent with the principles of stewardship, which are contained in that third objective. Let me move to the next slide, if I can. Yeah, here we go. Yes, there we go. Um, this slide just sets out EOPA's priorities for the next period. Um, and you'll see there are seven. Um, there are kind of five general ones and two of more specific focus. So uh, in relation to the potential framework, number one, um, this relates in particular to the directives which set the prudential framework for uh, insurance and pensions, so Solvency 2 and IOP 2. Um, in the case of insurance, I mean, the, the, the negotiations are at the political stage um, in relation to the extent to which sustainability considerations will be, um, will be included in the insurance regulatory framework. On pensions, EOPA has been asked by the Commission to provide advice on how sustainability should be reflected in um, in the in the prudential framework for for pension funds. But I think what is kind of key is that is this kind of integration. So, for example, in both cases, investments are under what's called a kind of prudent person principle. So it's not sort of, um, it's not sort of strict direction as to what investment asset classes should be, uh, should be used, but um, it should be done prudently. And what, what has been a noticeable trend has been to integrate sustainability into that. So including taking account of sustainability is part of being a prudent person. It is not something separate. And I think that is the kind of one of the kind of major leaps that has been made in, in recent times, both in, in insurance and pensions. In relation to number two, consolidating the macro and micro prudential risks, um, clearly there is a financial stability aspect to, um, to ESG, uh, ESG issues and 
EOPA and you know and the other ESAs carry out analysis, for example, um, the sensitivity of insurers to to physical risk. In relation to number three, sustainability disclosures and conduct of business. Um, I mean, this goes back to the sort of consumer objective, which I referred to before. But you know, this talk, this covers areas such as ensuring that disclosures, conduct of business, you know, the extent to which investments are sustainable, the extent to which they may have adverse impacts on sustainability are are, are covered. Um, the fourth one on supervision. Um, Again, yeah, the, the, the regulatory framework can be set, but then of course, in terms of sort of more practical day-to-day -day supervision, um, yeah, it's important that there is kind of relevant guidance, for example, on use of climate change risk scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, then there's two more specific objectives. One is in relation to protection gaps. Um, this essentially describes the difference between um, what is at risk from a particular hazard and what is the extent of the insurance um, and you know, it is striking that say in relation to natural catastrophes there are significant protection gaps i mean it is we believe that something like only 35 percent of the potential risk to the european economy from natural catastrophes is covered by insurance um, so one of the tasks is to identify this and we'll be releasing um, estimates of the protection gaps um, by the end of the year. Um, so one of them is to, is to measure the gap. The other is to seek to address it, whether that be by um, encouraging more insurance or on the other hand, taking measures to mitigate or to adapt to the, to the hazards rather than um, only using insurance. So that's one specific area. The other is the um, promoting the use of open source modeling and, and data in relation to climate change risks. So, I mean, we, we do not believe that um, the ability to reflect climate risks and so on should be the property only of the sort of well-resourced. So we, as an institution, are promoting open source modeling um, and you know, the provision of data, particularly in relation to climate change risks. Then the seventh one, maybe I'll just move to the fi my final slide to describe that the international side um because this just sets out sort of where eopa works and of course we work at different levels uh, we work with the national supervisory authorities who comprise our border supervisors so the 27 members of the eu we help um be part of the commission's overall strategy for um for the green deal um and this, as it says, integrates EOPA's areas of activity in relation to um, various directives and other measures. And finally, at international level, we are active both in the International Association of Insurance Supervisors and also in the NGFS, the Network of Central Banks and Supervisors for Greening the Financial System. That was a very quick tour of um, EOPA's work on uh, well, objectives and priorities for sustainable finance. There's much more I could say, but I hope that gives everyone an idea of the sorts of things we're working on and happy when the time comes to take any questions. Uh, Al Moro, back to you. Thanks, uh, uh, Justin. Thanks a lot. It was short but very comprehensive, so congratulations. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, François-Louis Michaud, who is the Executive Director of the European Banking Authorities, to present um, EBA's activities on uh, ESG risk and, and, and sustainable finance. Possibly, the floor is yours. Virtual floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Amoro, and very happy to be uh, with you today on such an important topic. I'll not be as smart as Justin. I'll rely on the team to show the slides, if that's okay. Um, the, at, the, at the EBA, so the, the, the European Banking Authority, the, we are the body responsible for putting together a rule book for banks and supervisors within the European Union. And we also do run some financial stability analysis on different types of risks, which might uh, affect uh, or impact on the, on the banking sector, banking sector in a general sense, because we cover banks, but also investment firms. And also we, we, we look at a number of additional players like service, I mean, payment service providers and, and so on. 
And we, we also, of course, uh, do that uh, ex ante and ex post, meaning that we uh, all advise the EU legislators uh, when they prepare their pieces of, of legislation. Uh, we also, uh, afterwards, uh, once the, the, those legislations are up and running and we have devised the, the technical standards to um, best implement them, we also check on convergence across uh, jurisdictions in the EU in terms of the practices from the supervisors and, and what banks are, are doing. So with this in mind, uh, we, of course, the, um, the um, sustainable finance topic is, is pretty um, front and center for, 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 for what we do. And we, we, we do contribute to uh, building the uh, framework for EU banks and, and for their supervisors to mitigate uh, those risks, uh, the ESG risks in general, but the focus admittedly at the moment is more on the environmental factors. And we uh, do our best efforts to support what we uh, call an orderly transition to a sustainable uh, economy. And the ultimate objective is to ensure uh, something at the end of the day that will be a proportionate application of the, of the standards. We also want to facilitate convergence at the EU and at the international levels. And we want, of course, to foster resilience ultimately of the EU banking sector and, and of the broader economy. What's interesting in the context of the EU, of course, is that banks do play a very important role. Justin was saying that insurers are society risk managers, and that's certainly true also in the EU. But I mean, a, a very a specific feature also in the EU is that banks are very central in terms of the funding of the EU economy, as we know. And, and for that reason, they are a, a perfect intermedi intermediary, uh, not only to intermediate um, you know, the, the channeling of the uh, funding uh, to those uh, who, who need it, but also to channel and to intermediate best practices and to facilitate also the adoption of new rules and new standards beyond the financial sector to their ultimate counterparts. So the, the, first, um, the first effort we've been uh, trying to uh, pursue was to help close the data gap. Uh, because as we know, there's a big data gap uh, at, the, at, the, at the moment all over the world in those, uh, to deal with those topics. We, we know that, for instance, we did a, a bit of a preparatory work two, two, and a year, two and a half years ago, where we looked specifically at a simple portfolio, which is the non-SME corporations uh, at, at the EU in general, with a very large sample of banks. And we could see that 60% uh, of those obligors, uh, which are not the least advanced ones uh, for, for EU banks, of course, uh, are, are facing a, a pretty high transition risk. And we also uh, could uh, measure that for 35% of those obligors, they are above the uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, median. So there is something uh, here that, that's important to keep in mind that we, we even when we look at, at those data samples, which are uh, the easiest ones, we see that the, there, there will be a cost uh, to transition. This will not be an easy uh, walk in the park. But more fundamentally, I mean, what we also learned with this exercise was that it's very hard to get to hard data at the current juncture uh, beyond the, the most simple uh, portfolios. And for a number of banks, uh, uh, it's, it's really hard to, 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 to have the, the right data at the moment, and not because of their efforts, but because it's all only early days for, for, for corporations and, and for uh, all uh, borrowers in, in general on those matters. So it's really important to close the data gap. That, that should be the first part of the, of the effort at the same time, we can also, of course, help supervisors uh, to find the, the, the best practices and, and build on the best possible practices to um, encourage banks to, to, to beef up the risk management setups and, and deal with those issues. And we can, of course, also start thinking about how we can embed ESG risks in bank regulation and bank strategies. So, those are the uh, sort of ultimate and intermediate objectives. Uh, of course, we, we try to do that uh, following a holistic and sequenced approach. Uh, holistic because there are many dimensions and it would be a big mistake to only focus on small aspects and, and, and lose the, the big picture. Sequenced approach also because not everybody can do everything at the same time, of course. So we, we need to, to go step by step, be gradual and, and, and first, you know, uh, get the, the momentum right and, and then build on that. And last uh, but not least, I mean, all this needs, of course, to be rooted in international and sectoral coordination. What's true for banks uh, also uh, is uh, true for uh, insurance companies, uh, <clears throat> sorry, and also for funds. 
and the data gap problems, the, the fact that, that, that different types of counterparts are, are moving uh, step by step. We need to discuss that in the Basel context. We need to discuss that in the EU at our what we call our joint committee with the Jews, with colleagues from AOPA, ESMA, the ESRB, um, Systemic Risk Board in the EU. We also need to discuss that in the context of other platforms like the, the NGFS, which was already mentioned uh, before. If I now uh, zoom a little bit more into what we do in practice at the European Banking Authority, going to the next slide. Uh, we, we do, uh, in fact, work on all, uh, try to fire on all cylinders. We want to uh, favor and foster a risk-based approach really rooted into evidence. And we try to address all three pillars of the banking credential framework. There are three pillars, as we know. The third pillar, let me start with that, is about transparency and disclosures. And we believe that this will be important to first start by closing the data gap because everything else comes from that. We can only devise the right, the right risk management uh, measurement and practices if we have the, the right data in-house. We can also, of course, only devise the um, prudential treatment in terms of capital requirements if we have also a good measurement, a good understanding of the situation. So we've been trying first to put all possible efforts on getting more data, on encouraging banks to uh, disclose more. Uh, for themselves, for their counterparts, for, for investors, and also to help people understand that this is a journey and that we don't have a good understanding yet. We are working on it collectively, but this will take time. So it's important to know about the unknowns and there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns to, to, to use a, uh, an old analogy, but we that, that's important to keep in mind so that we can also go into uh, what uh, people call an orderly transition. If, if there are views that it's an easy uh, game and that we could easily move to the next step, then we'll be making uh, big mistakes. So we shouldn't be jumping the guns there. We should really build on uh, installments one, one after the other. So, so first part of the work was on transparency and disclosures. We've also uh, released uh, guidance on risk management and supervision, what's called the pillar two. And now we are working hard on what could be a, a potential capital treatment for those exposures, what's called pillar one. And we've published a consultation paper or discussion paper in the last summer. We are uh, now working on the answers we've received and we'll be publishing something more final in the, the middle of next year, towards the middle of next year. Uh, and, and what we've so far communicated about that is that there's a lot of that we can do already with the, the existing tools. So before one starts talking about uh, green suborning factors or, or brown penalizing factors, First, we can also uh, capture a lot of those risks through the, the, the existing instruments. When it comes to valuations, when it comes to uh, ratings, for instance, there, there is a lot of, uh, of that information that can be uh, also used uh, in the context of the existing models uh, that banks have. Now, we are also working on uh, future uh, uh, further aspects. One is uh, having a supervisory reporting uh, that, that's well uh, harmonized. We also work on standards and labels. We also work on preventing greenwashing. Uh, and beyond the environmental aspects, we also uh, want to uh, broaden up and, and embark next also in social and governance factors and how that can be reflected uh, in the uh, monitoring uh, framework. So we have a number of things underway and uh, just like to give you a bit more uh, flavor of what we do and how that fits together because we uh, like like many of us we, we we keep publishing things and we keep delivering on mandates given to us by the legislators so here is a sort of landscape that that gives a uh, good account of what we've already uh, delivered what's underway uh, and, and and when as much as possible on all those aspects. So we, we see that, in fact, the, the pillar three disclosure uh, is the, the, the first uh, and most important uh, aspect at the moment. We are also now uh, beefing up what we do in the context of the ESG risk management and, and supervision. Uh, we've done a pilot climate stress test or a preliminary stress test in, in 2021. And now we are working on what would be uh, the, the next generation of stress tests and we do that uh, in, across sectors first, because the legislators has, have asked us to, uh, with AYOPA and ESMA, to uh, do a one-off stress test across sectors to sort of um, understand better the linkages uh, on those aspects. 
uh, and then we have also a mandate to uh, embed this um, dimension, environmental aspects into our uh, EU-wide stress tests. Um, but that's a very different game uh, compared to what we've been doing so far with the EU-wide stress test, which were all about uh, simulating what could be capital de depletion under very adverse scenarios. Here we are talking about something which is much more forward-looking at a much longer horizon. And we uh, will be joining forces with uh, all the supervisors who have been very busy uh, developing uh, pilots and, and first models in this in this area. And of course, we uh, will uh, continue working on, on, on reporting and, uh, and on, on what could come next beyond environment to make sure that on all E, S and G, uh, we, we have everything and that, that's needed to tackle all those new challenges. Maybe I can stop at that now, Almo, and uh, of course, very happy to answer uh, any questions and to continue the discussion. Thanks a lot, uh, Francois-Louis. Indeed, uh, it, uh, very nice the way you put all your products together in, 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 in one slide, covering the various aspects. And now we move to sort of the slightly more operational aspect, if I, if I can put it so, with the presentation from Patrick Ami from the ECB. Patrick is uh, the head of the director general for specialized institution and less significant institution at the ECB and very relevant for today, he is a person in charge of integrating climate related uh, risks into the ECB supervisory approach. And for all the non-European colleagues uh, listening to us, the ECB is the uh, bank supervisors for banks in 21 uh, member states in the EU. So it gives an idea of the scale of, 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 of your responsibility. Patrick, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Almoro, and uh, many thanks for inviting me uh, to present also on the CB and the single supervision mechanism initiatives in this respect. Let's go to the slide deck immediately and uh, to slide two already. Um, uh, just to start with, of course, the fact that we have um, uh, established climate related and environmental risks as a key risk and supervisory priority since 2019. And as you can see, uh, this is remaining very high on the agenda uh, uh, of the SSM for the years to come. And I will uh, probably uh, give you uh, and try to give you a little bit of, uh, of uh, a picture of what we have been doing so far, what uh, is uh, already planned, and uh, focusing on our latest uh, products and analysis, we um, just happened to publish uh, the outcome of a thematic review on climate related risks uh, so a few days ago and i think it's uh, it's uh, perhaps a, a good uh, way to start with this one so let's move to the next slide um, we uh, started our uh, journey in 2019 with a number of discussions with uh, banks, uh, the industry, uh, with uh, national supervisors, and issued at the end of November uh, 2020 uh, um, an ECB supervisory uh, guide or expectations on uh, what we would uh, want to see from banks in uh, managing these uh, risks. Uh, important to mention two things. These expectations uh, are uh, focused on climate related and environmental risks. Uh, we are not broadening them to ESG risk in general, but really focusing on climate and other related uh, risks, environmental risks. And um, we uh, uh, secondly focus on risks precisely. So uh, we have grounded our expectations, uh, each and every of them, on the current version of the regulation that is applicable to us. Uh, so this is really um, the way we expect banks should apply and implement already the current legislation uh to uh, mitigate uh, these risks um we ended up with uh, 13 different uh, overall expectations and uh, based on this we have um, uh, endeavored to deliver a number of follow-up activities um, a thematic review of climate uh, related and environmental risks and i will say a few words about this uh, in the next slide um, also a climate risk bottom-up stress test where we published the uh, outcome earlier this year 
And uh, finally, um, uh, a few gap analysis on uh, disclosures. We published one at the end of 2020, another one at the end of 2021, and we will publish an update again uh, later this year or the very beginning of next year with the aim of uh, in the three, uh, in the three um, categories and environment of our work with the aim, of, of, of course, of pushing banks to um, uh, adapt as soon as possible possible uh, their uh, risk appetite, risk management, governance uh, arrangements uh, to uh, emerging risks like climate and environmental risk. And I think it's fair to say that they have emerged already pretty, pretty much. Um, we also complemented this with a number of targeted review, notably on commercial real estate. Uh, we do also uh, dedicated on-site inspections. And um, we have started incorporating uh, the consideration of climate risk into uh, uh, also procedures like uh, the um, authorization of qualifying holdings in banks or uh, fit and proper assessment for um, bank uh, officials. Let's move to the next slide. Um, uh, so that we just published uh, 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 this month, uh, earlier this month, uh, the thematic review on uh, uh, the way banks have been incorporating our expectations into their frameworks. Um, uh, to recall, we started this journey in 2021 by asking banks to give us um, a gap analysis uh, from the distance between their current practices and the expectations in the guide we published in 2020. Then we asked them in the same year to provide us with an adaptation plan and how they would would come closer to our expectations. And this year, we uh, uh, went a little bit more into detail to check whether they were effectively implementing what they had committed uh, with us to implement. Um, what we can see that overall, banks have uh, improved their capabilities. Um, however, um, as we have put it already, uh, we believe that the glass is not even half full yet. And as you can see, we still have a number uh, of institutions that have some way to go in implementing consideration of these risks into their governance, risk management, uh, and risk appetite frameworks. Um, most banks have devised uh, at least basic practices, but uh, we remain uh, with a lot of progress uh, to be made to, in order to further implement those risks and fully implement them into banks' practices. Um, let's move to the next slide. Um, just to give you also uh, a quick uh, uh, walk through uh, the findings of the bottom-up stress test we published in July this year. Uh, uh, where we uh, show that um, uh, bank uh, still generate a considerable, a considerable share of their uh, income uh, from carbon intensive sectors. And so this means that this risk is uh, definitely material for most of the bank and for the banking industry in general. So uh, we will need to follow up very, very much with respect to transition planning and uh, I think uh, we have a number of regulatory initiatives uh, coming from uh, the European authorities in that uh, in that respect, and that uh, there are definitely a very important follow-up uh, for uh, us as supervisors and for the banking industry. Um, we have seen as well that uh, uh, banks in loss projections uh, were uh, already reporting uh, rather sizable uh, potential losses from the stress test based on a rather limited sample of exposures. So uh, one could think that at the scale of the European banking industry, 70 billion of aggregate losses might not be much on the three years horizon exercise, but we should keep in mind that uh, uh, 
uh, we uh, de facto run that exercise on a limited number of uh, portfolios and exposures in the banking industry. And so we would expect that these uh, potential losses will only increase over time. Um, and uh, finally, of course, we uh, came up with a number of recommendations to the banking industry uh, to make sure that they further embed uh, the consideration of climate related risks in their uh, own stress testing practices. Let's move to the next slide. Um, uh, just a glimpse of uh, another of our products that we published in March 2022. So the, the gap analysis on, this, on disclosures. And as I mentioned, we endeavor to uh, publish a, a new um, a gap analysis on disclosures in the coming months. Um, we uh, have uh, here again identified uh, quite a number uh, of uh, uh, banks for which the need for progress is uh, dire. And um, uh, although we have been seeing progress compared to the uh, first analysis we did in that field, uh, we still have uh, quite a number uh, of um, uh, improvements to be made in terms of uh, transparency and substantiation of climate related uh, risks. Of course, uh, as was pointed uh, before, uh, we still have uh, data gaps that we recognize, uh, but we believe that um, uh, it is uh, important for banks to start uh, working themselves and, uh, into uh, this topic. And uh, we believe that there is uh, quite a bit of work they could be doing themselves in tapping their own data lake, uh, engaging further with their own customers, and of course, we will uh, we will continue benefiting from progress in uh, disclosures across the board, corporate disclosures in particular, that will help solving data gaps. We have also participated within the NGFS uh, to a number of initiatives to further disseminate existing data sources, uh, relying also on open source um, data dissemination. We believe as the AIOPA that this is a very important way forward and avenue for progress for the banks. And so making sure that uh, we uh, create more awareness on the already existing data sources, including on physical risks, uh, is, uh, is part of our efforts. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, we published together with our report on the thematic review uh, published earlier uh, this month, a set of what we regard good practices. Um, we are, uh, do not dare calling them best practices already, because there is still a long way to go, but we can already uh, detect a number of good practices uh, and that uh, the fact that we have good practices on all these uh, uh, thematic that you can see on the slide is uh, extremely comforting. It demonstrates that swift progress is possible. Important to note as well that we detected those good practices um, in all categories of banks. So uh, irrespective of size, geographies and business models. So uh, that is rather comforting. It means as well that we expect uh, that banks continue making very swift progress because it is possible. And let's move to the next slide. Uh, as a result, uh, we have decided that we would set a number of deadlines for banks to uh, continue embedding into their practices our expectations. And uh, we will have different timelines. Of course, they are all bank specific and they take account on the bank by bank basis of where they stand in their own journey, in their own organization. But we nevertheless want to make sure that uh, by the end of uh, 2024, all banks will have implemented our expectations into their uh, practices. And, and to recall, uh, these expectations are uh, grounded on governance, risk management, risk appetite arrangements. We have not uh, yet gone so much into detail with respect to quantifications. So it is very important that we have swift progress uh, where it is still needed. 
And um, we have uh, mentioned to the banking industry that we will be making use of uh, the full uh, toolbox that, uh, that is our, our mm -hmm. disposal uh, when banks would be lagging uh, further. Uh, and uh, to finalize this with the last slide uh, on uh, our roadmap on uh, climate and other uh, environmental related risks. Um, in 2023, we will be uh, monitoring the progress of banks with respect to the shortcomings we identified in the thematic review. Uh, we will have a number of targeted deep dives as well. Um, and we will uh, start implementing uh, a number uh, of these elements into our own uh, methodology for assessing uh, banks' uh, 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 progress and banks' capital uh, situation uh, and banks' governance and risk management situation and what we call the threat, the, the supervisory review and examination process in our jargon. And we will, of course, follow up uh, with uh, our tools where uh, needed. And of course, uh, after after this, we will start uh, seeing a number of new regulations and uh, uh, coming in, and we will, of course, uh, be part of their implementation. I stop here, Amor. Many thanks, uh, Patrick, uh, for this uh, impressive overview or the overview of the impressive activity of the, of the ECB. Uh, on 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 the ESG and the climate risk uh, uh, aspects for 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 the banks. Uh, I would like the technical uh, uh, people to put on uh, my the slides for me and Larissa. Um, to some extent, what we are going to do is to to recap what uh, we have been hearing and to give a forward-looking perspective in terms of legislative changes that we are putting in place to introduce obligations to uh, uh, firms and powers for uh, uh, supervisors. Um, so please, next slide uh, quickly, and I invite uh, participants also to send in questions to as soon as uh, we finished uh, with uh, uh, my presentation and Larissa's presentation, we can have a bit of interactive access section. So as you see, there are four areas in the uh, regulatory landscape, and we're talking mostly about prudential requirements supervision. There is an element on uh, on disclosure, which was mentioned uh, by uh, both uh, for we and Patrick, and actually, we are going to publish soon uh, um, uh, the uh, disclosure templates and publish them in the official journal. The disclosure template for banks, for large banks at the moment, uh, prepared by EDA for the banks, put them in, in use by uh, 2024, 20, uh, uh, which uh, are an essential element in uh, for the banks to do reporting. Actually, this is not even more reporting, it's disclosure for uh, uh, the market participants to have visibility that in turn will produce a lot of uh, data. So next slide, please. On on the banks, we we, we try to do a, a one slide to capture all the angles uh, from which are relevant, as you've seen uh, from the presentation by Patrick and uh, from the presentation by uh, Rui, there are some very many angles, uh, and it's uh, really uh, the impact on on the management of climate risk cuts really across all the activities of the banks as well of the insurers, as will become clearer in in uh, also by uh, in the research presentation. So let's go to the next slide to focus uh, a bit more on what we are proposing and, and what is moving forward actually in uh, the uh, legislative process in the EU. So we are proposing uh, um, uh, in, in the banking package three different uh, aspects. One is obligations on banks, so to have strategies and process in place to ensure the proper uh, governance risk management frameworks, to, for banks to have uh, medium long-term plans to address risks with uh, quantitative targets. And then uh, we also propose to expand the disclosures on ESG, not only to large banks, but also to small banks, because we think that actually uh, ESG leads are very important also for small banks who, who are more concentrated in their exposures. So I think it's as important, uh, it's even probably more important for small banks 
to work on those issues and to disclose uh, on, on the risks and work on the disclosure of ports banks to, um, to to reflect the report on 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 their own exposure the second chapter of what we are doing is to uh, give, empower the supervisors in a very clear way um, on uh, uh, to have the capacity to test uh, uh, the resilience uh, the, of, of the banks in terms of long-term impact of the SG risks, on uh, rearrangements for their identification, management, and management, on this rep uh, uh, process, and uh, and sort of clarifying the powers which are already there, but I think it's healthy to make them uh, uh, clear on uh, on on how the set can be used in in, the, in that perspective and then we are, are also giving a number of mandates to the eba for future work one we are anticipating a deadline for the work that also Louis was mentioning on the pillar one aspect and then to uh, ask eba to issue a number of guidelines on on identification management on the threat on the content of the long-term plans so to help both the banks and supervisors in in uh, in, in their work so um, this sort of uh, work which is uh, moving forward now in the uh, uh, legislative process uh, was supported yesterday in 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 council and is now moving through uh, parliament is um is to some extent to uh, move a one step forward collectively on 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 the way uh, um, climate financial risk, climate risk are managed in the in the banking sector and supervise or have the uh, necessary powers. Um, Larissa, you want to integrate on on insurers, my and Larissa name. is my colleague from the in, insurance team. Larissa Dragon is my colleague in, in, on insurance team, um, uh, sister unit here in the in uh, in the uh, DG fees by the Commission. Larissa. Many many thanks, Almoro, and I will complement also largely what Justin already said but maybe with uh, what we can do here at the European Commission to propose legislation and other measures. But before doing that, as this is very technical, I will maybe dwell a little bit more to explain where climate change impacts mostly insurers. And to recall, the insurers collect upfront premiums for the promise to pay claims in case predefined events are occurring. So these insured, insured events are uncertain and it is hard to know so which persons will be affected. So what, what insurers do is to pull the risks from a large enough group and to use statistics and actuarial techniques to draw up reliable estimates of the overall claims. This will be then translated into risk-based premiums. So it's very important to get uh, the numbers right, to have them reliable as there is a clear relationship between the frequency, severity of damages covered and the premiums that are charged. And, and if premiums are becoming too high, there's a risk that consumers will not take up insurance. So as providers of risk coverage, insurers need to be able to reliably estimate future claims first. On the other hand, we have this time lag between premiums and claims payments which allows insurers to invest the premium income and generate a return. So insurers have a dual role, an additional role as institutional investors. Unfortunately, in both roles, insurers may be adversely affected by climate change. As in the case of banks, physical and transition risks may affect the value of their investments. In addition, physical risks can translate into increased claims payments, which affect the affordability and availability of insurance. And more generally, climate risk can affect the frequency and severity of climate-related risks and undermine, therefore, also the reliability of claims estimates, unless this is particularly anticipated. So what are we doing in, in the EU to, to basically ensure that insurers integrate all these risk considerations? We are using all available instruments to incentivize better integration of such risks in, in insurance activities. And we have the capacity to propose binding legislation and have a very comprehensive framework already in the EU, the Solvency II. For the time being, this framework is not, it's only generically referring to risks incurred by insurers and not specifically to sustainability risks. So that's why we proposed last year in September 20. 21, uh, some changes to this framework to amend the solvency too, so as to strengthen the insurance management of sustainability risks, particularly climate 
uh, change-related risks. This is currently negotiated by our co-legislators and we hope uh, it will be finalized uh, in the course of next years. So what did we propose under these changes? We, we propose that insurers are required to identify any material exposure to climate change risks and to assess the impact of at least two long-term climate change scenarios on their business. They will also be required to take into account climate change in the management of macroeconomic risk. As in the case of the banking package Almora was just referring, we did not propose to change capital requirements. So there is no proposal to introduce some sort of green supporting or the brown penalizing factor. Instead, we gave uh, two sustainability related mandates for EOPA. The first mandate is to explore whether insurers investments with environmental or social objectives should have different capital requirements than other investments. Uh, it mirrors very much the uh, mandate EBA already has. And under a second mandate, the EOPA would have to review regularly whether the current capital requirements for the exposure to natural catastrophe risk remain sufficient in light of the climate change. Luckily, uh, in the EU, it's not just about legislation, which takes a lot of time to be put in place, but we have quicker regulatory tools that we used to actually integrate more quickly a certain uh, sustainability aspects in the current rules. So uh, we have adopted last year, and they are applicable already, a package of sectoral so-called delegated acts that concern not only insurers, but also institutional, other institutional investors, such as asset management, as, as well as uh, insurance distribution and investment advice. So under these technical rules, insurers are required to fully take into account sustainability risks in their systems of governance, risk management systems, and in their investment activities. Furthermore, we have changed the technical rules concerning insurance distribution so as to integrate sustainability preferences into insurers' product oversight governance and into the suitability assessment of distributors. And let me finish with a slide that explains basically um, the role of uh, insurance in climate resilience. Our society's resilience will much depend on its ability to reduce future economic losses co caused by uh, climate change. And we are not yet there. And the climate protection gap is already large. To recall, Justin already explained it, protection gap is a share of the non-insured economic losses related to total losses after a climate-related event. With extreme events increasingly becoming more severe and frequent, due to climate change, access to insurance may become increasingly limited. Issues of affordability and availability of insurance, especially for people, property, and activities in hazard-prone uh, areas, have the potential to widen this insurance protection gap. Against this background, there is a strong demand for action to take st steps to reduce and prevent the gap from becoming larger. And this has to evolve a lot of stakeholders, including insurers, authorities, but also other interested actors. We are very much promoted, uh, promoting at the Commission such interdisciplinary discussions, and therefore we have set up um, a climate resilience dialogue, which will serve as a platform for different stakeholders to discuss ways to tackle the climate protection gap. This dialogue will uh, start at the end of this month and we will go throughout the next year. It will push for a better understanding of the climate protection gap in insurance, an analysis of the costs of inaction, the benefits of adaptation, and it will hopefully identify best practices and bring out uh, voluntary commitments to better adapt the climate change and lower the total economic losses. And I'll stop here. Thanks, uh, Larissa. Uh, no, thanks a lot. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, but uh, we got a very uh, uh, good the, the double question, so I, which I'll split in two. The first one, and I'd ask it to Patrick, is how are supervisors identifying potential stranded assets? If you do, and how you do it? Patrick, what, what, how, do, how do you identify stranded assets? Yeah, many thanks, uh, Alvaro. Sorry, just the time to unmute myself. Um, 
Um, this is a very complex question in reality. Um, uh, uh, what we, we can already start doing, of course, is uh, making use of the EU taxonomy to start with. Um, uh, identifying um, usually uh, the sectors where we already know that the transition uh, challenges will be uh, the most important uh, and that we can identify why in our jargon or in what we call the NACE uh, codes uh, uh, when we, we can effectively statistically identify which uh, sector an entity uh, or a counterparty or a company belongs. Um, but once we have done that, this is only the beginning, because then you need to identify uh, uh, which assets a bank uh, uh, is actually financing. Is it, uh, is it financing the, uh, uh, the overall company? Is it uh, f uh, doing project finance? Is it uh, uh, financing specific developments? Is it financing um, uh, activities that have uh, as an objective uh, the uh, uh, improvement of the carbon emissions uh, situation of this particular uh, company. So uh, you could be uh, invested in a particular sector and be extremely uh, busy with financing the transition. And so that is, of course, something that where we will need to refine over time. This is only the beginning. And I think stranded assets uh, will come uh, over time also uh, when uh, some corporates are would be lagging behind in terms of transition uh, efforts. So uh, uh, we try not to jump to conclusions immediately, but uh, uh, zoom uh, in on the uh, most relevant sectors and make sure that banks do engage with their customers also with transition planning and this is i would say to me the most promising of the the regulatory developments we are uh, seeing in that respect uh, coming our way and the, the best way to make sure that we move uh, the entire banking sector into helping into the transition many thanks patrick indeed and it's um and it's a and it's a complex issue also because i'm not sure there is a single definition of those stranded assets are firms are doing de dealing with uh, many assets so it's uh it, it's indeed one of the challenges we we, we were facing ahead and speaking about facing ahead the overlooking dimension which is one of the most interesting but also most complex uh, aspect the the second part of the question that we got got which i would turn to also we and justin for their respective part is what is the time frame that you look at when you look at the climate environment at least it's five years ten years longer yeah. um and more if i may i can also i'd like to second also what patrick was saying on the uh, stranded assets because i mean the key word i guess here is transition and you, you can have one uh, guy in a in a sector which looks like a doomed sector but if they manage well their transition then they'll be out of the woods and then they won't end up having stranded assets in, in the end. So, I mean, it's a lot about how do we assess uh, and how banks will be assessing transition, how supervisors will be assessing banks, assessing transition, and so on and so forth. So I think that that's the that's why we are so um, cautious about uh, everything that 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 resembles a, uh, a brown penalizing or, or green supporting factor, because even for those industry which seem to be in uh, uh, sectors uh, which which are uh, affecting negatively the uh, environment. Uh, I mean, there, there might be a light at the end of the tunnel for for them, depending on how well they manage their transition. So it's a that that's really why we should not jump to conclusions in this area. Now, moving to the horizon, the, I mean, the we we hope the horizon is as long as possible. On 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 that, the problem is that we we should clearly so. Let, let's look at the current potential framework. It's mostly uh, predicated on past data uh, with some complements coming from stress test, which are at the three years horizon. So clearly that doesn't work in this uh, context. And, and now what we, what we have in front of us is something that should be uh, looked at from a, uh, at least uh, a 10 years perspective between 10 and 50 years perspective uh, and, and 30 years being, being, being in the middle. But, um, of course, the, 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 the slower we move uh, in this context, I mean, the, the, the shorter the horizon. Uh, and uh, if we, if we uh, play it right, then maybe the, the horizon will be uh, 
you know, uh, remote enough. So I think the, the, the again, there is no very clear, uh, you know, certainty in this context. We are all working on what would be a decent horizon. There's a political dimension to it as well. We also need to fit uh, with the objectives that uh, policymakers and legislators uh, give us and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, put us as a, as a, as a target uh, for managing the transition. Um, so, so that that's a sort of a moving uh, environment. Uh, there are moving parts, uh, but very clearly, uh, it's it's uh, it's it's not the three years that we have now, and it's uh, it's more uh, towards uh, ten years to to start with, I would say, which which is in itself a big problem. Coming back again to the question of the uh, transition that we were uh, talking about uh, before. And Moro, do you allow me a quick intervention just to add very very quickly? Uh, yes, please. To add to François Louis, uh, I think um, I, I fully agree with what François Louis was mentioning. I, I would say that the, the time horizon is now, uh, meaning that any bank that would not engage already now into uh, working its customer base towards transition uh, uh, would be building stranded assets for the future. And uh, and so I think uh, this is why we will pay so much attention to transition planning going forward. Uh, because uh, uh, time for action uh, is now. And of course, uh, we, we still know that uh, conceptually uh, the time horizon to incorporate into banking regulation is, uh, is a difficult uh, debate, but it should not prevent banks from moving now. And if I may on the... Exactly, uh, on, the, on, on the insurance well, on side, the, because the long term, uh, the, long, the real long term business uh, Justin. Yes, I was going to say, I mean, insurers and pension funds, for that matter, are long term institutions. So although the crystallization of a lot of climate changes is probably longer than the typical business planning horizon, um, yeah, those the time periods we're considering are well within the period of, say, a life insurance policy or, or, or a pension. So, um, as as uh, Patrick said, um, yeah, the time to start considering these, if you're an insurer or pension fund, is now. I mean, we, in our guidelines on also and how uh, climate climate risk should be incorporated into ORSAs, I mean, we defined there the short term as 10 years, the medium term for climate as 30 years, and the kind of longer term longer than that. So, yeah, these are these are long periods, but as I said, they are well within the span of a typical pension or life insurance policy so um you know, steps have to be taken now thank you well, thanks uh, justin i think we've uh, finished the, the the time so actually we even went uh, a couple of minutes uh, beyond um so i would like to uh, to thank all, uh, all the panelists for for their presentation very rich presentations which actually illustrates the rich activity which is taking place because indeed there is an urgency and the moment to look at these things from banks and insurers is now. Um, I hope uh, that the uh, participants uh, 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 appreciated the richness of, of, of the presentations. Um, I think uh, uh, the presentation probably will be available. Uh, in any case, the uh, recording is public and will be publicly available. And in any case, you have access to all the materials uh, referenced to in the respective website of the EOPA, uh, ECB, and uh, in the Commission to, um, to, to in, for, in our case, for the proposal which are under discussion. So if you need uh, uh, more, more information. So thanks a lot uh, uh, to my uh, colleagues uh, who uh, contributed to the uh, discussion. And uh, good afternoon to uh, everybody. Thank you.